Ben Plowden is a TfL director who's coordinating the authority's COVID-19 restart and recovery program. So uh, Ben, can you tell me how you're planning the various phases of getting London moving again and over what sort of time scale? Yeah, so we've broken our response to the pandemic down into sort of three broad brackets. Uh, we've called them restart, recovery and rebuild which broadly correspond to time frame. So restart's really been where we've been for the last 12 months or so, responding to the changing government guidance around restrictions of various sorts, responding to changing patterns of demand, making sure we can, we can support the essential journeys that have been going on the whole time. I think we're now into the early part of what we've called the recovery phase, which is assuming the government's roadmap continues to roll out on the phased basis they've suggested, uh, we expect demand to increase as people start returning to workplaces, to shops, to central London for culture and, and uh, entertainment and so on, uh, and increasingly make the journeys they were making before the pandemic. So the challenge there really is to make sure that we've got in place the requisite public transport capacity that would continue to support walking and cycling journeys so that as people start making those journeys again, uh, they know that there is a safe, reliable, clean and orderly public transport system waiting for them. Uh, they know that if they want to make a journey on foot or by bicycle, increasingly they can do that as an alternative, for example, to a short car journey. And really reassuring the public that the transport system is there to support the recovery uh, and won't be in any way an impediment to that recovery. So we're talking very closely with business about their plans, working with them where possible to kind of smooth peak demand to avoid uh, any kind of crowding issues in the early days of the of the roadmap being implemented and, and really making sure that we understand how demand is changing week to week so that we can we can manage our services accordingly. In terms of uh, looking at the streetscape program, which were rolled out uh, changes very quickly, there have been various legal setbacks. H had that made it more difficult for you to act with sort of agility in dealing with uh, changes, necessary changes? Well, clearly, uh, some of those decisions have been obviously disappointing for us, uh, and in where appropriate, we're, we're sort of going back through the judicial process to see if we can challenge them. Uh, but I think, and clearly, we need to make sure we've taken account of any of those rulings and ju judicial decisions in thinking about both the design and consultation and implementation of any future streetscape schemes. But I think if uh, we are interested in making sure that the recovery from the pandemic is sustainable, both socially, economically and environmentally, we will need to make it safer and easier for people to make walking and cycling journeys, particularly for local journeys to and from local town centres, but also potentially for commuting into central inner London. Um, uh, and if you're interested in that, if you're interested in decarbonisation, if you're interested in air quality, if you're interested in improving public health, if you're interested in uh, a more equitable transport system, then continuing to uh, put in place improvements for those walking cycling journeys will be very important. So I think that we obviously need to take account of those rulings uh, if they come through and, and factor them into our planning decision making. But I think uh, it's very important to go on providing those alternatives for people, particularly if you want to avoid a car-led recovery, because the one form of travel that seems to have held up quite well, ironically, is car-based travel, uh, certainly compared to public transport. So we need to make sure we're, we're avoiding that where we possibly can. So um, nobody quite knows how our habits are going to change in, in the longer term, it's, but what sort of scenarios are you looking at in terms of things like the reduction in number of commuters because of more home working, more people remaining in outer London during uh, the week and even a wider reduction in London's population? So we've produced five scenarios uh, which informed the submission to the government through our financial sustainability plan uh, called things like low carbon localism uh, uh, and uh, business as usual which suggests going back to life pretty much it was before and those make various assumptions about exactly those sorts of questions commuting patterns retail demand uh, population size whether the population redistributes across London for example or, or changes in size and each of those is associated with different patterns of travel demand by public transport versus walking cycling versus car use uh, and assumptions about freight for example and we've used those to sort of inform our thinking because at the moment it's too early to tell I think exactly how the pandemic will will affect patterns of life and patterns of travel in London long term. The one that we've used uh, for uh, the kind of central case if you like for the, the financial sustainability plan is called the hybrid which essentially has taken the th things we think are most likely to happen from those scenarios 
uh, and then we've added into that for the purpose of thinking about the financial situation some assumptions about the level of capital investment we might need to make to maintain and improve the park transport system so we're just sort of keeping an eye on those scenarios as time passes it will become clearer which of those or which combination of those scenarios is actually materializing and then of course we'll need to uh, invest and, and operate the transport system in a way that supports whichever pattern of life emerges in a way that's most sustainable in terms of carbon emissions in terms of social equity in terms of um, air pollution in terms of uh, encouraging the shift away from private car use to to walk site public transport which of course is one of the mayor's long-term goals in the transport strategy if we pursue the policies around the the, the 15 minute city which the mayor has said he he, he supports yeah. what effect would that have on uh, transport infrastructure more widely i mean if if there's a reduction in demand for uh, radial movement how can you improve orbital movement which generally is, is pretty poor in in in, in outer london well, I think we're assuming that it may not be either or. So I think we're assuming that there will still be significant demand for radial journeys into and out of central London, um, not least because we suspect that, that offices will start operating again in central London. Uh, we think that there are lots of other reasons why people will want to go into the centre of London for, for culture, for entertainment, um, for uh, you know, re visiting research establishments, all those sorts of things. So we need to make sure that there's still a really decent radial transport system in place and that doesn't sort of, uh, if you like, go off the boil and make sure that insofar as people are starting to spend more time in their local area uh, or more time in and out of London, that we're also putting in place both the infrastructure uh, and the transport services that allow those choices to be made in a way which is sustainable from a transport point of view. So take my own example, I live in Clapham in South London, I can pretty much do most of the things I need to do within a 15 minute walk of my front door, and certainly within half an hour of my front door by bicycle or by public transport. That's not true for, 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 for some parts of London. So making sure that people can make sustainable travel choices if they're spending more time where they live or near where they live is going to be a really important part of, of the future pattern of investment and operations. So for example, how does your bus network operate? What can you do, for example, with um, some of the suburban rail services, if we got to, to manage more of those to support um, uh, orbital journeys, thinking about the patterns of travel that people might need to make and making sure that those can be made in the most sustainable way possible. And as it becomes clear whether that is where we're going, uh, then we obviously need to make the adjustments accordingly. But to some extent, a lot of what we've been doing in the past and are continuing to do around, for example, town centre improvements in outer London with the boroughs, are entirely consistent with that 15 city model, 15 minute city model anyway. So I think it would to some extent be continuing with that investment as part of the longer term recovery. Just to remain on the topic of orbital movement for a moment, uh, uh, that's quite difficult to deliver uh, without fairly substantial investment, unless one looks at sort of new technologies. Uh, uh, I mean, is that something which is on your uh, agenda? Yeah, and, and of course, the issue about sort of journeys between, for example, town centres and outer London is not, not a new one. Uh, it, it's obviously uh, it's quicker to do that, for example, by um, changing the pattern of service on the bus network, because although you can't do that overnight, you can do that relatively quickly. Uh, and we are now thinking about what the kind of distribution of bus services should be if we see a shift in demand from central London to outer London, for example. And that will partly be about servicing trips to local town centres, but also potentially between them or between, uh, you know, business parks and, and area, residential areas. Um, and also, we, we were talking to the DFT before the pandemic about the extent to which we might take on some of the more some of the suburban rail franchises and again uh, what the london overground has shown is if you provide improved orbital connections which the overground does in in the areas where it operates that can have a huge benefit for people who want to make journeys within out of london uh, without going into the center coming out again so i think both longer term around looking at rail services and shorter term potentially uh, in terms of looking at what the bus service might do, we absolutely need to make sure that we're supporting those journeys um, as well as journeys, radial journeys to and from town centres as in outer London. And I would guess if you're worried about, uh, a, a, let's say, a car-led uh, recovery, isn't it then a time to bring in more uh, road pricing right across the city? Well, I mean, the, the mayor has asked us to look at, as you probably know, at a boundary charge um, uh, as part of the kind of continued conversation about how, for example, to manage traffic in particular, make sure that the recovery is uh, is is sustainable. It, it's a conversation that's underway. Um, it, it's 
challenging, I think, to, 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 to think about how you might do that. Uh, but certainly, what you know, as the congestion charge has proved, and as, and as I think from an air quality point of view, uh, the ULEs and the expansion of ULEs will prove, um, pricing can be an effective part of the toolkit. You just have to make sure that you've designed a scheme, if you decide to implement one, that, that is that is just you know is warranted in terms of its its traffic and environmental benefits um and is understood by the people who might have to to participate in it so you you keep in touch with other transport authorities around the world many of whom actually look to tfl for leadership in a lot of these things so uh, what uh, cities are doing things that we could learn from in their response to covid so it's interesting that you might imagine there's been a huge amount of dialogue between cities internationally, both kind of bilaterally, but also through organisations like the UITP and C40 cities. I think we're all facing similar versions of the set or different versions of the same challenge. So, for example, the significant reduction in fare box revenue as a result of the pandemic and, and restrictions on travel. Um, questions around how you reassure the public around hygiene and infection control issues around what you can do sensibly in the short term to improve walking and cycling. Pretty much all the cities we're in touch with are, are dealing with very much the same challenges. And now we're coming out of the pandemic, assuming and hoping that we are, we're into conversations about what the long-term financial viability of city transport authorities might need to be, what other sources of revenue might be available for, for funding long-term improvements in the transport system. And I think there's a lot of, you know, we're all learning from each other. So people talk to us about things like ticketing and um, integration of transport services but we're talking to other cities about um, you know how they raise re revenue for example from commercial development and I think there's a very fertile exchange of, of thought and, and best practice right around the world really and 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 no one has a monopoly on wisdom in that regard we know some stuff that other cities don't know but they certainly know stuff that we don't know and we're making sure that we that we learn that from them Yes, although, of course, Paris has stolen a march on everyone with some amazing image of the Champs-Elysees being turned into a park, hasn't it? We haven't got anything quite like that. Not yet, maybe, but no. And, and it's a really, I, I've always been intrigued, Peter, by the sort of benign competition, if you like, between cities, because it's not really a zero-sum game. If Paris does well, um, you know, in terms of schemes like that, and uh, that, that doesn't make us do less well. Uh, and so things like cycle hire obviously was initially developed in France and is now uh, in Paris and we, we now have it in the UK, but a lot of the stuff we're doing around some of the street space, space schemes are being copied elsewhere. So it really is a sort of entirely uh, benign form of competition, if you like. I don't think there's any, there's no kind of adverse aspect to it. And I, and I think that's great. It's people borrowing the best of what other people are doing and, and putting it into, into place in a way that's locally relevant. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for your insights. And Good luck with your work over the next uh, few years, really, because it's going to be so important to get London back on its feet. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me, Peter. Great pleasure.